Welcome to the Film of Stein, the podcast where we discuss all things movies. Join us as we dive deep into the latest releases, revisit classic films, and explore the art of cinema. Whether you're a film fanatic or just love a good flick, we've got you covered. From Hollywood blockbusters to indie gems, we'll be breaking down the storytelling, the cinematography, and everything in between. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and get ready for some cinematic magic. If you like what you hear, please consider subscribing to our Patreon at patreon.com slash We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level, where the $20 tier grants the ability to request films for future episodes. How cool is that? This is the Film of Steins, where movies are more than just entertainment, they're an experience. They're an experience. All around you. You, you, you. And welcome back to another episode of the Film of Steins. I'm joined today with my gold-digging friend, Lucy. How are you today? I am okay today. Did you take your gold to the bank? Yep, took my gold to the bank. Got some checks to write checks and, um, yep. Did you get your free sucker? Yep, got my free sucker. Nice. Cotton candy dum dum. They give actual dum dums at the bank these days? I thought it was just those weird round suckers that you get from the car wash, though. Actually, I think they stopped giving suckers. suckers. Oh, that's lame. Uh, post COVID. Like during COVID, they that kind of went away? Yeah, pretty mm-hmm. much. Well, today we're talking about a pretty interesting movie. Sisu. Sisu. Directed by and written by <laughs> Yalmari Henlander. Yeah. How's that sound? Or the Joel Joel Mari. Is there a J or a Y sound over there in Finland territory? I do not know. Yep. I'm not Finnishnessness Finnish. enough. Finnishnessness again enough. Yep. This is an interesting movie. Coming Very. right hot. We're coming right off, steaming hot, seconds off of John Wick. You know, we moved right into this immediately after John Wick. So there were some, some shadow to get out of. Yeah, right? for sure. And I can't believe that this film did. You know, I hate to put the uh, that kind of shallow bias into the mix, but John Wick it was so fucking good. It puts so many things to shame, but God. Damn, this movie is excellent. Yeah. Give me some high-level thoughts. Well, I like this movie quite a bit. It's not a very, you know, it's not a very thought-provoking film. It's not uh, one of the best classics movies that's going to go down in history. You know, it's purely entertainment and joy well, it's not joy. It's not a joyous film, but joy watching it for sure. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's a fun movie. Um, very gory. I don't think we're too familiar with very many Finnish films. I'm not. I don't keep up with every film and where it comes from. Mm-hmm. But so I'd be a little surprised if there were, if we've seen more than like ten Finnish films. But we have seen a couple, and this director actually directed one of your favorite Christmas movies christmas movies yeah (laughs) the polar express yeah (gasps) what he directed the polar express no he directed a really niche probably not seen by many eyes christmas movie very rare rare called rare exports (laughs) 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 you like the Rare Exports. Oh. What is that movie about? You love that one. I love. I that like that movie. one too. That's gonna be a tradition now. Yeah, that we have to watch that every Christmas for sure. Yeah, I mean that's a weird ass movie. It's a weird ass horror Christmas movie, and I love it. I mean, you know, it's about these diggers, I guess, uncover Santa Claus or what should be what we think about Santa Claus, not you know, uh fat dude in a red suit and giving out presents no it's actually uh what's his name like the f- compass crumpus the crumpus like character yeah crumpus like character with the horns and he's huge and then we have this weird premise with people being elves i mean it's weird it's it's, <laughs> it's fucking weird it's and then weird. they need the money because wolves have been attacking the reindeer that apparently this you know dad has a reindeer farm 
but wolves have been eating the reindeer, so now they don't have money, so they end up training these people as the, the elves. Yeah, the elves, Santa's elves, as Santa Claus, and selling them and exporting them to. They are the rare exports. Yeah, I mean, it it's a it's a weird weird movie, and I love it. And it yeah, it's one of these movies that has no right in being as good as it is. It's. And I, I think it's, you know, in the realm of this movie. Although this, this isn't as weird as, uh, what is it, Rare Express? Rare, rare Exports. This isn't as weird as Rare Exports, but, you know, it's still as entertaining. Yeah, and maybe as absurd, <laughs> at least, right? I mean, yeah, pretty we, we do have a guy who catches himself on fire, can hold his breath. That's not really all that unbelievable. Maybe in this specific scenario, he dodges a lot of bullets and um, tank shots and survives a plane crash. So there's a little bit of godlikeness happening yeah. here in Absurdity, which is maybe on some kind of level playing ground as just the insanity of rare exports and just where it goes. It definitely... Yeah, it definitely has that. Story-wise, rare export is balls to the wall crazy. This is... This is, I don't Sisu is, <laughs> I don't really know. It's fucking nuts. It's it's crazier than even John Wick. John Wick feels much more grounded than this. I know. <laughs> which is crazy. Yeah, man. So I just wanted to start off the top by saying that it was written and directed by the same guy, which is always, I think, a sign of a vision coming to life. Not necessarily quality, but I think there's probably a parallel between two, right? But I did want to start off with saying, too, that the intro... Before the Nazis got involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, The part where you were like, you're basically, it was boring you. You were like, when is this going to start picking up? And I was just like, oh my God, (laughs) this is my favorite part. (laughs) And it was, yeah, that probably is my favorite part of the whole movie. It just helps build the mood, real gritty. He's digging these big holes. I like the prospecting thing. You know, I like the camping out, the digging through the water, digging the holes, the dirtiness, the dog, the animals, the flat land, the, you know, the water. I think I said the water. But one thing I really liked about this intro part was compared to another prospecting scene, which another movie I really like is this anthology movie called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs mm-hmm. by the Conan Brothers, Netflix movie. And one of those shorts is about a pros- prospector finding gold. And he digs these little holes throughout, you know, this little area to find you know, the traces of gold so he can dig a bigger hole. And But this guy dug big-ass holes everywhere. They were awesome. It was probably like six or seven big-ass holes down the riverbank or down the creek bank or whatever. Yeah. I loved it. Loved that. Did you notice? No. <laughs> I was bored. And then probably one of the greatest shots was when he was looking across that plane and he was seeing the explosions, and then it would shine back. It would, you know, look back at him. The camera would look back at him, and you could see the explosions kind of faintly on his face and stuff. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and then there was even um, a shot where I think the sun was going down, or maybe it was after the explosion, or some some kind of lighting caused the ground to be a little bit gold, goldish. Like, just a spark of gold just for a second, which, I mean, yeah, okay. I can appreciate that, I guess. (laughs) Yeah, you're not a big fan of, I've noticed at least, I mean, sometimes it gets you, of course, but you're not a big fan of um, sequences that set the mood, especially in the intro section. If they don't hook you, you you can be quick to, to, to bow out. Yeah. Which I can't blame you. I mean, there's a lot of shit out there. But no, I mean, I want to be over there where the explosion just happened, <laughs> not here with this dude. <laughs> I want to be exactly where we're at. No. Oh, I didn't. <laughs> Put me over there. That's funny. And it's got kind of a, there's almost kind of a, a hyper naturalistic look to it. And we get a little bit of that, a little bit of that on him, especially if you look at the poster, it has that, hy- that hyper realistic look where, you know, yeah. people like to draw all these hyper realistic things and, you know, flex their ability to push the details of every pore and she's like okay you know that's what you learn in your sophomore year of college y'all that's <laughs> fun that's cool and all of it you know it's makes some actual artwork but you know anyways <laughs> and that happens a little here on the uh 
You know what I'm talking about? Like on yeah. TikTok and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. It's it's so fucking trite. It hurts. I'm sorry. But we can see a little bit of that here in the poster. You see it? Yeah. I have the poster up. And so, but we see a little bit of that also echoed throughout the entire movie in a that gritty kind of dirty, you know, war scene kind of aesthetic that we see in a lot of war movies, especially the recent... All Quiet on the Western Front reminds me a lot of that with the filth and stuff. It's, it, except All Quiet on the Western Front is, by every measure, a much filthier movie. Great movie. But I love how, like you said, when we were watching the movie, or whenever, how he was taking a bath in the water. Hopefully he was yeah. taking it downstream a little bit <laughs> away from his camp. He looked dirty afterward anyways. Yeah, he still like, looked dirty. Like... But it's just kind of, it's kind of a relativistic thing, right? A bath in that... He is clean relative to his <laughs> what he was 30 minutes ago, right? <laughs> this is kind of funny. No, yeah. I mean, with that, even, you know, his dog was so dirty, too. And it was one of those sheep dog. I don't, yeah, I don't know. know what that was. Yeah, it was kind of a sheep but it was dog very, thing. very fluffy. It almost had like a poodle look. Yeah. I don't know what that was. And that just gets dirtier so it was white ish and it was whitish i wonder um how difficult that is to make everything look so dirty when filming or if it's something you tack on you know some sort of filter per se to make everything look dirty i mean i'm sure you have to make the actual you know actors and actresses you know dirty it, it's kind of funny to have that that to be part of the makeup people's job. Yeah. It will be. Job. And, I mean, kudos to them for thinking about everything. Even their, I mean, even their hands. You mentioned um, at one point that their hands also look so dirty. Which, you know, I, I don't know. I guess I've never been an actor or actress. But if you go to the bathroom and you wash your hands, they're clean. And you come back. It just seems like a little detail that you wouldn't think to, I guess, dirty up your hands again. I don't know. Maybe you do. And I'm just thinking wrong here. But, yeah. you know, I it's, mean. This kind of thing is pretty rare, I think. This is one reason why All Quiet in the Western Front was so praised for its um, production design. And it won, you know, its Oscar and everything. And won probably many other production design awards because of exactly that, that attention to detail to you know the very natural things that would happen in a scenario like this or you know him being out in the wilderness for god knows how long yeah. or or you or the middle of a war scenario and during war one in the trenches where it's fucking raining and you don't have a lot of you know things to cover anything because you're in a fucking hole a <laughs> hole that's just gonna collect water and become yeah. mud and shit you know so you can imagine like you can imagine how in like some sense how easy it is to make that happen but making it look like you've been splattered by shit because of the gunshots and the rain and the mortars and stuff how do you how do you make that look convincing i don't know yeah it's fucking insane it's fucking insane especially especially they're all quiet in the western front but here it's a little more minimalistic mm-hmm. the uh, grittiness is probably the loudest part of this movie other than the guns and in the in the tank shots, <laughs> <laughs> but there's not a lot of dialogue, right? We our dude, our Sisu dude, um, a Tommy Corpy. A Tommy Corpy doesn't speak okay. much. <laughs> he doesn't speak to the last twenty seconds of the movie. Okay, maybe. John Wick. <laughs> I know that's total page out, John Wick. Yeah, I mean there are quite a few parallels that were very interesting like that that they were both very quiet awesome fighters <laughs> badass yeah, fighters very capable people yeah and then um the dogs the what's dogs. up with all these fighting people liking dogs nobody yeah. likes cats i guess cat people are the ones that stay at home and you know and cat people are often like bad guys that's true. That's Which is, true. You know, in Bad Guys, because you could have seen in John Wick, you could have seen uh, the Marquis with very a, easily yes, with a cat. With, he would look like a cat guy. With a Maine Coon, you know, yeah. something very big and powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind, of kind of a funny thing. Yeah, so, I mean, he uh, 
doesn't it's not long until he come across some Nazis. They call that that specific this specific well I don't really know, I'm not too versed in Nazi history. We probably all should be, just so we you know, because it's an important piece of recent history. Um, but they call them, I think they call this a death squad. This specific group of Nazis. Okay. This this specific platoon of Nazis. It's called a death squad. And it's ran by a a uh, commander guy who is, di- who, who he talks directly to Hitler. Oh. So that, yeah. This is a big, big guy. Yeah. And there's, there are several of them throughout history I saw. Or, I mean, there were lots of them, but uh, this is supposed to be one of them. Not a real one, but, like, he's supposed to, you know, that's how much of a badass Nazi he is that he was, oh, you know. For well, his... now more of that movie starts making sense. Okay. No wonder he's desperate to get Yeah, because he's... The gold. He's definitely going to be killed. Yeah. He's definitely going to be killed. I thought he was just being, you know... Uh... S- greedy hungry person like some of the, the driver and some of the other guys probably wouldn't have been killed yeah once they surrender or oh, once they're defeated okay yeah so i mean he, I, I got it but now that's like okay yeah. all right dude i get it yeah I he get would have had to were so desperate he would have had to run to argentina like hitler did <laughs> that's the theory yeah. do you know about that i mean i've i know there are several theories that's out the big there. theory that he uh, escaped to Argentina and lived out his life. I wouldn't be surprised. That was one of the big. That was that was supposed to be one of the big moves into the Western Hemisphere was through Argentina. The Nazis were going to come up, mm-hmm. and it never really happened. I know you said your favorite part was the intro scene. Oh well, yeah, the rest of the movie's still great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's your favorite part. Yeah. You know, mine is definitely when that horse. Oh my god. Blown up. Talk about one of the most badass way for an animal to die. I mean, that was so gruesome. Yes. That was disturbing. Yes. That was awesome. It was so awesome. When they were, because they were going back and forth, the cuts were happening between the hooves and I think yeah. the tank, the and guy the tank. on top of the tank. Mm-hmm. And it was, I was like, I was like, what? It did it like three times probably. I was just like, what is going on? Before I could even say anything, the horse just fucking exploded. Yeah, <laughs> by stepping on a mine. That was that was awesome. That was and insane. I, you know, I noticed too the back and forth and them really focusing on the on the I can't say that word. The hooves. The hooves. <laughs> That's a weird <laughs> word. But I thought maybe. Um, we were supposed to pay attention to the path he was going on yeah in the way in the sense of getting lost or something of that sort you know i never thought he was gonna step on a fucking mine and blow up that was nuts that was nuts i was thinking about when i was seeing when i was looking at his hooves i was just thinking about you know those tiktoks and youtube shorts of these horses who have gnarly fucking hooves because yeah. they haven't been taken care of in years. And, you know, how they clean them up yeah, in the videos yeah, yeah. and stuff. That's, that's, what what was, that's what I was thinking about. I was thinking he's got nice hooves for <laughs> well, being out here. Care of. Yeah. This dude knows what he's doing. And then he blows up. There's a horse head. Some horse torso. Leg here or there. And that's it. Everything else has been blown up into tiny little meat pieces and, and his gold goes everywhere too. his gold yeah his gold goes everywhere he's covered in horse guts guts and skin but it's so fucking tiny because it got blown up bad yeah and it's just his he's covered in it yeah that was one and of- also he has to be like aware that he could step on another one all while the tank was coming back and they couldn't believe their eyes because this is this guy had just killed their the friends lagging behind. Mm-hmm. They didn't see it, so they're not ready to shoot him, right? And they're watching this guy, thinking, you know, you can only imagine they're thinking this guy killed these other our other our Nazi dudes. <laughs> that old man. Like what? You can only imagine that he was thinking that. And he was picking up his gold and stuff, and and uh, what did he do? Yeah, he threw a rock at a mine, and it created a dust cloud. And then he was, you know, they shot out there, and he was had that his gold pan deflecting some bullets which i guess in itself is 
I don't know if that's possible, but I mean that doesn't matter. <laughs> that doesn't matter. <laughs> Gotta yeah, that's a little bit of that's a little bit of that thing that comes out in people when they don't. Oftentimes, when people don't like a movie, they'll immediately be like, "It's unrealistic. That would never happen." You know what I mean? You've heard that a million times. I'm oh sure. yeah, for sure. That that's what that was coming out right there. I don't know what that was. That was weird. Weird, weird Freudian slip of society. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's always annoying when people do that. But then the the Nazi leader was sending out guys and they were getting fucking blown up and stuff. It was <laughs> and They so were nuts. all looking at each other like, oh, I hope he don't send me yeah. next. And he was pointing at him. You're next. You too. Please don't pick me. <laughs> that was awesome. But he gets away. He gets away. I mean, they keep following him. And then I think that's when they start going after him. Right after that is when they discover the dog tags, right? His dog tags. And then um, they trace that his, I don't know, number, person number. And they call whoever they need to call to get that information. And then they find out he's a... They find out who he's dealing with, who they're dealing with. Yeah. He's only the deadliest man to ever be. He's only killed hundreds and hundreds of Russians single-handedly and... And they were specifically given an order to don't go after him. Yeah. But then he's like, fuck. I want that gold. I want this gold. And he wants it for himself because he later, you know, we find out that he's going to, he's going to, he's going to kill these any leftover guys. Mm -hmm. So he thinks his numbers can help, help him get that gold. He's not even thinking strategy really. Yeah. The Sisu character. What's his name? Uh, a Tommy Corpy. He was inspired by Simo Hayaha Hiyaha. Yeah, Simo is right. Who is Ah-ha-ha-ha. considered to be the deadliest sniper of all time during war ever? But he was he fought. He was a voluntary soldier. He wasn't just drafted. Who volunteers? Who's I know. ready? <laughs> <laughs> I know he's and he's killed. Nobody knows how many people he's killed because. Most of it was accounted by him himself. So okay. It's no cooperation. So it's kind of hearsay at this point, right? Sort of. But he, uh, he was a hundred percent accounted to have killed uh, over five hundred people, not including his like machine gun kills, like non-sniper kills. Oh his hand to hand combat and his machine gun kills aren't counted. And then if there are multiple shots going off at once, those weren't counted either. And so he's there have been over 500 accounted for, but it could be as much as it could be as many as a thousand. It and so sounds he was, like it could be more. Yeah, it could be. And he was only in the military for about a year. Oh. And so on average, you know, he killed <laughs> I mean, on average, he killed about, you know, five, three to ten people a day. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. That's insane. Wait, wait, wait. Is that right? No. Um, about three? Yeah, I mean. Three to five-ish, yeah. Not ten. Ten's too much, yeah. But about three to five people a day. Yeah. St- I mean, that's, that's... That's nuts. Voluntary. Vol- voluntarily joined the Finnish army. The Finnish militia. Okay. I don't. I don't know what that is really, but is that, the fi- it's that the Finnish much... militia civil guard at seventeen too. Seven at seventeen. At seventeen. So he's it's that's crazy, and he went on to live a long fucking life uh, until he died in two thousand two. So he. Uh, that's. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. So that's where the Sisu main character was, or kind of origins start at. Um, with obvious inspiration from John Wick. I mean, I think that's, there's no fucking way this movie is not pulling a John Wick, but there's also this other film called First Blood. That's hilarious. First Blood's a Rambo movie. <laughs> I, was, I didn't know that. That's Okay. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I'm not familiar with Rambo, you guys. I'm sorry. That late 70s, early Eight or eighties era of movies is a miss on me, minus Eraserhead and the rest of David Lynch's stuff. But yeah, man. So he he escapes. He 
get some rest under a burnt up vehicle. They come looking for them because they need they they want the gold. They got dogs. Were those dogs in John Wick? No. <laughs> this dog was poofy. He was poofy, was he? Wait, wait, which which dog? Wait, what? What? The German shepherds, the Nazi German shepherds. Oh, those dogs. Yeah, the re- sniffing for him. All right. But then he coated himself in gasoline, of course, so the dogs wouldn't. I forgot all about so, well, that. Well, I guess specifically so the dogs would lose his scent. The scent. Yeah. Which is awesome in its own right. I don't think I never. I'm not gonna think about that. I didn't know a dog. I mean, I know, but I didn't know. Dogs have to keep the scent that things can fuck it up. I mean, that makes sense, hundred percent. But damn, and of course he, at the same time, is covering himself in gasoline. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, that only means one thing: he's got to get in water to wash it off, or he's gonna catch himself on fire. Yeah. And then he does both. He does both. <laughs> but how big of a how big of a, a World War Two trope is that? Losing scent from a Nazi dog. I don't know. I haven't seen very many World War Two movies. Well, I guess I've seen, not seen, I've read a lot of World War Two books, you know, whether some were uh, based off of true stories or not. A lot have clever ways to get rid of dog scent. So that's, yeah, I, f- I forgot all about that scene. That yeah, probably, I mean, I guess that, I mean, I can only assume that happened quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, dogs are useful to a point, but they're very useful to get a scent, you know, <laughs> yeah. to, to follow a scent, I should say. So they, uh, the dogs see him, of course, as he crawls out from under the moving truck that he grabbed hold of while he was hiding. How does no one see that? Or you you feel the weight? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you gotta, you know, that's one of those things. You gotta hold hold your horses, you know. There's a little bit of an absurd element we just gotta get yeah, on, yeah, get yeah, on that's hold true, of, that's true. you know. We gotta stay on our absurd horse. No, don't get off of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the dog, the okay. dogs see him, and he, he fucking, we see that close up of him lighting himself with a match, and he fucking bursts in flames, which look awesome. I don't know if that's real. Flames in movies usually don't look very good. I'm just gonna, you know, or anywhere in video games or whatever. Mm-hmm. Obviously, video games CG completely, but. He looked fucking <laughs> insane on fire. And of course the dog's not going to fuck with that. So he jumps in the water. They come after him. And one by one he fucking <laughs> takes him Jason out. Jason Voorhees is these guys. Also in the most badass way he's in the water holding his breath. They're waiting for him to come out. Send one person down there and he slits their throat and starts sucking their oxygen so he can keep breathing underwater a what <laughs> excuse me i don't see I'm john sorry. wick doing that yeah shit. you just it's it's it even like surpasses badass because john wick john wick is badass well, i would call this metal yeah this tab this is this, this is, is definitely metal this is i mean this puts a whole new meaning to nazi sympathizer you feel bad for these guys because they have a fucking I don't feel bad for these guys. You don't feel bad for these guys? No. They deserve it. They do deserve it. I'm glad there was someone there putting them in their fucking place. Yeah. So he escapes again, sort of. Finds his way back to his old crib. His old town. I assume, was that what that was? I don't know. I mean, he seemed familiar with it, so. Yeah, I don't know. I think he was just hurting so bad. He was visualizing stuff and hearing stuff. You know, his family, I guess, and a baby crying. Or maybe that was happening, but was also happening to him. I don't know. Well, no, it was deserted, wasn't it? Yeah, it was burnt down. Yeah, it was burnt down. Yeah, I mean, maybe he was in so much pain, he was oof, imagining shit. Or it could have been his town. I don't, I don't remember. Because his family got killed, and that was with the Russians. Pre-World War II. It's probably World War One with the Russians. Yeah, and that's when he started getting his vendetta, really, and he started becoming a killing machine. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. It could have been. He probably didn't live anywhere then. That's I guess because he was when his family died and he went just he uh when when he went on his solo career. <laughs> his solo career. <laughs> he uh, I don't know if he had a home at, at that point. He was just on the move, killing folks, looking for gold. 
But they, uh, the Nazis find him with his own dog. They strap a stick of dynamite to the dog. <laughs> and you're like, fuck. The, the dog's, dog's dead. Yep. The dog is dead. This guy's not dead, but the dog is fucking dead. But no. He, he peels it off and throws that shit and it does not kill them. Yeah, I'm glad the dog survived. I think that was a big a trope in a lot of earlier movies to kill the dog you know the dog was always dying but i'm glad they kind of s- they're steering away from that and letting the dogs live in movies i appreciate that because there's nothing that gets me more than a fucking dog dying Ugh. i'm bawling if the if a dog's dying i'm bawling <laughs> <laughs> so i'm glad they let him live well, but then they hang him he's hanged and how the fuck is he going to get out of this? You're like, this is... It's... Yeah, he, maybe he's going to wait for the rope to rot or something. <laughs> hold his breath. <laughs> he's just going to hold his breath. That's like a very Chuck Norris thing. <laughs> are you familiar with the Chuck Norris memes? Yeah. Those are pretty old. Those are of the OG meme days. Yeah, that ro- rope is going to get scared and... Run untie away. itself untie itself <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he uh i mean he hoists himself up with his boo-boo on a fucking big ass nail sticking out of this you know wooden beam that's holding the sign up and he just to to, to alleviate some of the pressure who thinks to do that like time like the directors and stuff and the writers or, yeah. the, or him himself. I mean, anyone. Who's it makes thinking? sense that he would, but <laughs> how do the writers get to the point, this is where we're taking this, and he's going to be up there for probably several hours. This is what he would do. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I mean, that makes sense. That's great, but you you good? Like, that's, that's a little weird. That's a cool concept and all, but, you know. Okay, I'm going to keep an eye on him. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, he's there. A plane pulls in. He, They see him. The sign's falling down all at the same time. And he just continues his fucking murdering spree. Is it murdering? I don't even know. Because it's kind of in the name of getting rid of the bad guy. Is it all murder? It's all murder, isn't it? There's a better way. There's not a better way. Uh, no? Not here. And not in this movie. Yeah, not in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's, I guess it is still murder. But he, uh, it's like a good murder? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not all. I, I would say not all murder is bad. All right. I will say that. Just like I don't think. Nah, hear me out. I don't think all rape is bad. Un, you know. Wow. <laughs> you just went there. Because if, for example, if the species is not reproducing and no people are willing to re- procreate, we're going to have to start forcing people so a la rape right and non-consensual so not bad i would say in that scenario that's pretty much the only scenario i would probably say i'm sure you'll have volunteers before it gets to that right i mean yeah i mean if you have volunteers then you're good but otherwise if there's no volunteers yeah i'm not agreeing with you on this one i'd have to think about it (laughs) I didn't know I was in an ethics class all of a sudden. Yeah, just, uh, you know, I... You know, uh, do you save that one person? Do you <laughs> kill that one person to save 10 people? Or do you kill it? All? You know, it's like those questions. Yeah, the train's headed towards yeah. the 10 people, but they're on one side of the train tracks. But if you turn it, you can save the 10 people, but there's one person on the other train tracks. And so which one do you make, you know? Yeah, and the yeah. moral right is to just ignore the problem. That's what you'll, what you'll hear. Oh, to ignore the problem? That's yeah. even worse. It's not your problem. Okay, have fun trying to sleep at night. I mean, you didn't set them up on the train track. Huh? <laughs> yeah, but you know about a problem now. It's like when people don't speak up for stuff. Yeah, that does drive people crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, it's you made it your problem by looking at it. Yeah, you... You're... There's something... I mean, there's something deep about that. That's something to investigate. Yeah. All it's right. relative. It's totally relative. And that that's one thing moralists will hate the fucking hear. But it's completely relative to how people feel about, you know, rel- you know, relative to how they feel about just every fucking thing in the world, you know? Yeah. It's Are there Nazis on this train? <laughs> exactly. Are, like, is this person, is this one person already old? Because, I mean, they live their life. Yeah, it can. Those are the kind of things they'll, you know, n- none of that, you know, you won't be told any of that. Uh. But, 
But the other stuff, there's still a lot to the other side of that. Yeah, but but right. we we have uh, our dude fucking hijacking a plane, hijacking a Nazi plane. He, he crash lands it in an elegant way. Plane's still intact. He brings one of the dead guys along, one of the pilots along, mm-hmm. and he's just pulling a fucking. He's making a trap for our Nazi friends that keep telling the main Nazi dude to leave. <laughs> let's get out of here. Let's not, you know, we're we don't, we're told to not be here, so let's not be here. You know, he's killed two thirds of our guys. Let's get out of here. You know. Yeah. And then I think at the same time, the ladies have taken over. Well, our our dude Corpy. Or is this exactly when he shows up? He helps him. He gives her. He gives that girl a gun. Yeah, he gives them all guns. And then, yeah, he gives <laughs> yeah he gives that one girl a gun, and then gives them all guns. So that's when they escape. Yeah, but one thing I guess I was gonna say about the hanging scene: John Wick also gets hanged in John Wick Four. Yeah, which was one of the weirder parts of the movie, I think. Yeah. Yeah, funny. But it's funny, it's there. Yeah, that's a funny parallel. Yeah. And that's that's purely obviously coinc- coincidental. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, for sure. Or you would. Or he'd get know. hanged in every movie, and then I guess Ram- yeah. Rambo would get. Rambo part. I bet. I guarantee you, Rambo gets hanged in one of his movies. I guarantee you. <laughs> All right. Someone needs to tell us. So he gives those ladies guns, which is awesome, because they that build up's really fun too. Because he's he's climbing in the back. He reaches for that gun. That girl backs up, and she he hands it to her. Mm-hmm. And then he turns in such a way that you see these fucking fifty guns on his back. Yeah. <laughs> They're just like, oh, he doesn't even fucking need it. <laughs> in fact, he gives every one of them guns. And then this, then this, uh, that part, this, this whole next sequence of them shooting and stuff, with the girls and him, it reminds me of a, uh, of a Robert Rodriguez movie, which is Quentin Tarantino's good friend, the guy who did Spy Kids. He just likes, he likes girls with guns and it just looks a lot like that because it's real dirty and dusty and it just, it just looks something right out of his movie. And especially when they're walking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and just it's ripped right out of a Robert Rodriguez movie. Thought that was kind of fun because those are like Machete with a uh, Danny Trejo. I've never seen that movie. Oh, oh I just realized that the poster was a knife, not a hat. You realize that too? You thought it was a hat too? I thought it was a hat, but you know, earlier until I looked close closer at it, and I was gonna say that, but you said something else and caught me off guard, so I was. I didn't bring it up. <laughs> I, didn't, I just now see in that. That's funny. It's the Nazis in the reflection. Yep. That's hilarious. I thought it was. So after the ladies take over and escape, they, or the Sisu guy takes, he takes the motorcycle and f- finishes following the main Nazi guy. Yeah, Bruno. Who then executes his final platoon member. You know, to keep the gold for himself, gets on the big jumbo jet bomber type thing, and yeah, and then Tommy's shooting at the plane and manages to get the pilot, but they they've already taken off and they're in the air, so we have a wounded pilot flying a plane, and it looks like he's about to, it looks like he's about to pass out, but then Bruno, the Nazi guy, is like, no, you're you're not about to do that now. So he's telling the pilot not to pass out, all while, you know, Corpy here had an axe and hooked himself onto the plane. A pickaxe. A pickaxe, <laughs> yes. Thank you. A pickaxe. And there he is in the sky with them. You're just <laughs> like... Just crazy. And he slips his pickaxe, which <laughs> I love. I love that it slips out of the thing and he fucking gets hooked around one of the back wheels. And fucking, and then he picks his way in from under the floor. Yeah, and they're inside the plane. Like, what is that noise? Uh, they're just praying it's not him. Yeah. And then I think the pilot says something like, maybe we have something to be worried about. <laughs> Which is awesome. He's like, no, 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 no. He gets his gold. He kills the guys. They have the final showdown. He drops. He hooks the main Nazi guy to a bomb. He explodes in a glorious way. Those explosions looked awesome. I don't yeah. know if they're real. Speaking of which, the explosions and the tank shots and stuff like that. Explosions aren't the hardest thing to create, you know, because you can just 
digitally create the trajectory of it and then have the explosion already ready to go and then just fire at the right time Mm -hmm. and it can look really good but these looked awesome they were huge they were and uh he looks for a parachute there isn't one he straps himself to one of the corners because we all know that if you're going to get in a wreck you want to make yourself one with the vehicle and he goes down who knows how fucking fast massive amount of momentum massive plane and it looks like he f- they he lands in a swamp. That's it looks like that was the uh the saving grace for him. Yeah, I thought I I didn't know it was a swamp. I don't know if you knew when that initial crash and the explosion of the crash. Um I just thought it was remains of the plane and it was all kind of uh burnt up. Yeah, like it was um how do you call that? You know, when the Hiroshima bomb and how like there's black everywhere. What do you call that? You know what I'm talking about? Mm. And then you see like the silhouettes of the people that got like blasted against the black, whatever that blackness is. Like the soot? Is it soot? Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess that's what I thought it was. I I thought that black stuff was the leftover soot of the bomb. You know, something like that. Okay. So I thought he was, I thought he had just vaporized basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I thought. So I was like, okay, okay. Well, he's done. He, the gold's gone. Everything's gone. All right, cool. Yeah, no, but they they couldn't end it there. He, he fucking crawls out of there. I know. He fucking crawls out of there. Oh, my God. And then it ends in, in a way that just wouldn't seem to work. Like, it ends in the most, I don't know, happy ending way it po- this movie possibly could have. Mm-hmm. And it fucking it sticks to landing hardcore. I just... I maybe, like the ending. I, oh, I love the ending. And maybe it has to some. There's some little bit something to do with we finally get our main guy. What's his name? Atoni. Uh, Atami. Atami finally says some words. I don't know what he says. It was in Finnish. Well, according to Wikipedia, he asked the teller to exchange the gold for large banknotes, and then he explains why. He explains that. They will not be as heavy to carry as the nuggets have been. So he kind of makes a joke there. But I don't know. I didn't see the translation either. So something along those lines makes sense for him to have said. No, absolutely. And him being a little funny about it. Yeah. Seems to, seems to fit. Yep. Yeah, that was awesome. A glorious ending to a glorious movie. Yeah, I mean, I even like the ending with the girls that they captured that uh, guy. I think his name is Wolf. I don't know if he was like a second in command or the uh bruno's right hand man yeah but they capture him and give him to the finnish finnish military military yeah yeah whoever they are which is funny yeah it's got to be pretty funny to see a group of lady pow's driving a tank delivering their captors right at your feet that's got to be something <laughs> they had him hanging that from was, the i know that was awesome was he tied i couldn't tell if he was yeah tied. He, i think he was tied that's awesome hanging from that thing whatever you call that thing the, like the tank muzzle i guess i guess tank gun it's a big muzzle <laughs> <laughs> if it's called that this movie this is a director to pay attention to yes i would say he doesn't he makes i don't love this movie i don't love rare exports but as in like a you know a t- in like the like john wick four kind of way or no country for old men or something yeah. you know that in that kind of way but this movie is something i could watch this is a good party movie yeah you know this this is an excellent excellent movie but this guy man he is he's a filmmaker he gets my filmmaking approval all right i'm gonna start doing that should I start doing that? No. Yeah, Is that'd that be funny? funny. That'd be funny. He, yeah. This guy, he knows what's up. And I mean, of course, there has to be something there, like you mentioned, that he was both the director and the writer. Absolutely, it's, there's it. It just definitely helps with the you know cohesiveness and getting the story to the screen. It, yeah. It it definitely helps. Because you know, there's because the other part of that that behind you know the behind the camera kind of side you know is the the camera guy himself and some directors are the camera guys a lot of times not well not a lot of times but there are some of them i can't think of any off the top of my head 
<laughs> is David Lynch? Does he do camera work too? I'm not. I don't even know. I'm sure he's involved. Yeah, he's, he's mega. Probably, he's if mega he's involved. not, he's sitting right there next to the cameraman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, most directors have their cameraman though. They have their guy that they does work. all of their movies. Okay. So there's an, an, a kind of a synergy there. Yeah. I mean, movies will prove it time and time again that if you're if you have a director who wrote the movie and then you know his main camera guy that's your that's a high level that's a high uh, probability of success because it's much easier for the person who wrote it who's telling the camera guy to what to do on some level to you know to capture the moment he knows is a direct you know kind of negotiation happening there and that's not the case when there's when the director isn't the writer the writers are not on set like that mm-hmm. in that capacity the only people who are talking to the cameraman are the director and maybe the major producer that's it so the writers are not involved like that wow i didn't i i guess i didn't know that i guess i didn't think about and so that. there's <laughs> there's a miscommunication there happening yeah. behind the scenes and of course a good cameraman is gonna you know be able to listen on you know deep level and try to try his best right right but that's i mean it's not like you're it's not re, it's not like you're recreating someone's handwriting or foraging like a 2d drawing and stuff something that's very static and you know not it's it's just not as complex i guess in a way yeah this is got much more oh, mind moving reading. parts for Ability. personality and shit and more much more mind reading stuff because there's so many moving parts mm-hmm. right so it's it's really cool. It's really fucking cool to see a director directing his work. I like that a lot. That speaks to me. That 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 alone, I don't think it matters who the director is. It makes you know, is a is a mark of, you know, it makes it makes me want to see it. Yeah, it makes me want to see it because there's I don't know there's something true and visionary about that, and I appreciate that on a deep deep level. Not that you know if you have. If you have the trifecta of the guys, right, or girls, whatever, you know what I mean? If you have the same writing, directing, and cinematography guys, DPs, every time, you can get away with it. Like, I bet you uh, Christopher Nolan has some of that happening, although Tenet sucks ass, so got him. Mm -hmm. Got him. Christopher Nolan, overrated. Say it. Christopher Nolan, overrated. Do you believe that? I don't know. (laughs) Tenant sucked. Whatever yeah. that, whatever. That was Christopher whoever, Nolan. Whoever that sucked. Yeah. It was. Interstellar. Interstellar. Great movie. Wasn't. Awesome yeah. movie. That was a good movie. In- Inception. Overrated. The uh, following. His first movie. Overrated. It following. The following. The following. I think just or maybe just following. Old following. movie. Student film. Okay. Pretentious garbage. All right. But um, back to our our boy. <laughs> He also um, directed and wrote Rare Exports. Good. So. Good. Yeah. I hope he continues to get funding for making films. It looks like he has another film in the works. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be cool to see that. Called Jerry and Miss Universe. Mm. So, that's cool. Yeah, Big Game is the only one we haven't seen now as far as feature-length films go, which has got that. It's got Samuel L. Jackson in it, so it's something it's something samuel jackson is something he is not a great actor but he is fun to watch at the very least is he a great actor what do you think his best movie is pulp fiction without a doubt you gotta rewatch it yeah i gotta, I, I hate on and pulp the other pic- and also the other fiction, guy who's the guy from greece what's that uh john travolta yeah him and pulp that's, that's what's his name john travolta is it john travolta yeah I think so. Okay. I'm thinking <laughs> Danny, but Danny's his name in Greece. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think. All right. But uh, no, he's probably the best as Frozone. Oh, of course. Frozone. Legendary. That's about it. Almost everything Frozone says is diamonds. And Gold. Kinda, yeah. I kind of like so him good. in um, The Avengers. He's okay in The Avengers. Okay. But he doesn't have big, big rules. Yeah. So he's okay. I like him a lot and um, do the right thing, too. He's the DJ. Kind of slash uh, narrator. Yeah. Love, love that role. He's yeah. not a big character or anything, but he he plays the narrator through the DJ. 
through the radio. How fucking cool is that? Spike cool. Lee, a legendary director. He all and most of his movies aren't super great, but he has got some borderline ten out of tens at the very least. Oh my god. How would you rate this movie on your letterbox? I'm curious. I'd probably give it a three. Good, solid three. Um, I was leaning towards a 3.5, but... Not enough story. Mm, yeah, not, not enough. enough character. Yeah. I feel that. I feel that. That's why it hits somewhere. It's one of these movies. It's so many movies fall into this range, which is dangerous business because you don't want to open up the 100-point scale. It's just fucking nonsensical, right? You want the max, the maximum boundary to be, you know, your 10. 1 to 10 point scale. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Or 1... 1.5 to 2.5 all the way to 5. Mm-hmm. You don't want to you don't want to get crazy with it. You don't want these decimal points. You know, you don't want this I give it a 36.759%. That's uh <laughs> wow, that's a 10,000 point scale. That's <laughs> yeah. that's even crazier. No, no, no. no. I'm not. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick with my 3 out okay. of 5. Yeah. But I was I was going to say it falls between a 2 and a 2.5 for me. I'm yep. leaning 2.5 just because of how original and fun it is it's just it's missing that for me too it's missing that character but it's effects and some of its lighting and set design or production design and the minimalistness of the minimum the the minimal the minimalism of it is that the the concept of minimal yeah yeah the minimalism of it is awesome love it it's dangerous it's so many risky things happening here just like in john wick actually john wick 4 at least where you could get a little just cheap feeling maybe pretentious one thing i was seeing a lot of reviews saying this movie is not pretentious like, that's a weird thing to say that something's not pretentious when no one's antagonizing Claiming you. it yeah Huh. Yeah, I even saw a thing somewhere on Letterboxd. Someone said anti-pretentious. And I was just like, this, that's, that's too post, post-modern for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't get what behind is, this. We what need is to, that about? We need to back it up with that nonsense. Oh, it's like God. saying something is aesthetic. Aesthetically what? And in, in what? Like and in way? <laughs> that's, even that's better. When to say, but to say something is so aesthetic, it's just like. Yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, no, yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa! Back it up. Back. What is, what is aesthetic? What's what's? We need to re-figure this out. Re-say that. It's almost like, like little kiddish, you know, for a kid to walk into a room and just say something random. It sort of is. Yeah. Like, um, you know, a kid walking <laughs> in and saying, "I don't have that toy." Like, what are you talking about, kid? Who even claimed? You sound like Chancey Gardner from being there. From what? Saying like random stuff like that and then people take it as profound. (laughs) People online, of Uh, course. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you said that online, someone's going to be like, yes, say it, preach it. (laughs) Yeah. You sound like Chancey Gardner, who is a gardener, profession. That's his last name and his profession? Chancey Gardner and his profession. He's a gardener. Huh. And it, it's it's just a play on words, kind of, because he's he's everywhere, kind of by chance too. Ah. There's a, um, thanks for watching this with me. Do you have any closing thoughts on anything, everything, all at once? Everywhere. Everywhere. Any <laughs> where? Anywhere. Any one. Anyone? <gasps> any closing thoughts? Uh, watch this movie. Have some fun. Watch it with a friend. How about that? Watch, watch this it. movie with a friend. You know, this might be a really good family movie, too. Yeah, watch this movie with your family. With your kids, with your little ones. I don't know. Well, pull them out. I don't know about that horse exploding. They need to see that shit. <laughs> that's going to make them men. That's going to... That's, that's going to make them scared of horses. That's going to make... Reason. That's going to grow some hair on their chest. <laughs> yeah, watch this movie with a friend. Watch your, this movie with your family. Don't watch it solo. I guess if you have to, you have to, but... Yeah, it's a great movie either way, though. Yeah. You want me to give you a hint for the next movie? Ooh. Make it a good hint. Not this Von Vick shit. That was... That I don't get. 
the most obvious fucking <laughs> hint I've ever given. Maybe it was too obvious that it just wasn't. My brain needs complexity. Oily fish. Oily fish. All right. Oily fish. Oily fish. It sounds like Nemo. It is Nemo. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for watching. And thanks for listening to the Filmasteins. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care of your loved ones. Take care of yourself. Eat right. Put down that cheeseburger. Drink some more coffee so you aren't hungry. <laughs> Eat some flax seeds. I'm just kidding. You can do whatever you want, but take care of yourself. Yeah. Thanks for watching this movie. It's a great movie. Take yeah. care, you guys. Take care. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Film of Steins. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed our discussion and gained some new insights and perspectives on the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash filmasteins. And follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching and keep loving the magic of movies. This is the Filmasteins signing off.